Um, I remember Cece, uh, Cece Houston talked about Whitney uh, Houston and how she knew that Whitney was very special and that she had a light on her, but she said she could never see Whitney in the future. She could never see Whitney in the in her 50s or in her 60s. She she could only see Whitney in the present, like in her dreams and stuff. She couldn't see her at an older age and how she always knew in the back of her mind that Whitney wouldn't be here long enough. And I feel like even though their situations are quite different, I feel like that's what I'm getting from Khalif Browder is that some people are here just for a mission, just to change or impact the world, and that's it. And yes, Khalif kind of got assistance on how he exited, how because of New York and how they treated him in this whole case. But I feel like because of what he did, because of who he was, um, he wasn't meant to be here, but he was meant to leave an impact um, years to come. And I believe that's what happened here, um, that he, man, he left a huge impact. Um, and we're talking about it now in 2017. When Hey everybody, it's Old School Hard back with another review for you guys. So first things first, I need you to hit the subscribe button down below if you are not a subscriber to this channel. Please also hit the like button, thumbs it up for me. Please share this video on Twitter, on Facebook, and on Instagram or wherever you can share it. That'd be great. Please leave your comments below as well. If you have not gotten a chance to already, I did upload my 1.6 seven month video on the Dr. Sebi regimen, diet plan, whatever you want to call it. So if you not have not gotten a chance to look at that, please go back and look at that video. If you're thinking about doing Dr. Sebi's diet, I think this one will be able to help you make a decision and you'll be able to hear some of the things that I'm going through while being on that diet. If you have not looked at any of the Khalif Broder documentaries, part one, two, and three, please also go back and look at that one. I missed some of you guys in uh, the part three uh, review. I didn't see you guys in that one. And so uh, hopefully uh, four was a whole lot better for you. Uh, part four was really, really good for me. I really, really enjoyed this part more than I enjoyed three. So um, this is going to be about Khalif Brothers docu documentary part four. And I will say I will call this... Um, Stalling until we break them. <clears throat> that seems like the best title for this. I don't know what Spike TV and Jay-Z uh, actually called this title, but I'm calling this Stalling until we break them. And <clears throat> basically that's what uh, part four was about. This is actually going to be really short because it was actually um, straight into the point. So at this point, uh, Khalid Browder has been in solitary confinement for a number of months. He is only, um, what well, he started off in uh, Rikers Island at the age of 16. So at this point, he's at 16, 17 years of age. Um, and he has been in solitary confinement and he has dealt with a number of things in solitary confinement from not receiving toilet paper to not being able to make telephone calls to requesting psychiatric um, assistance and not getting any. So at, um, <clears throat> this is what we're seeing in this part of the documentary. Um, they start talking about a lot more about this alleged night, May 10th, 2012. Sorry, 2010, I believe, <clears throat> which is the day that Khalif Browder uh, was arrested for supposedly uh, robbing someone of a backpack. <clears throat> so they actually go back to the day that the um, victim said that he was robbed of his backpack. So um, this is an Hispanic guy. Uh, he's from Mexico. Uh, he has moved to the United States uh, to, you know, do like many other people, try to earn a living. He is living with his brother. He has just gotten off of work um, and he is on his way home, I believe. 
and two young black males approach him and take his backpack. And I believe his backpack may have had a couple of valuable things in there. I don't think anything over the amount of $300, but basically they rob him of the backpack. So he calls his brother and he tells his brother that he's scared and that somebody just robbed him of a backpack. His brother in return calls the police. The police meet him and his brother at their house. And uh, basically they um, go around looking for potential suspects of the crime um, and they don't find anybody. Now we find out in this episode that there is no police report filed, uh, nor do they ask the victim, does he want to file a police report? Basically the victim tells him, tells the police officers that there were two young black men that took his backpack and they ran. Now in the same location of them taking the backpack, there is a camera installed in there. And um, the brother says, he tells the police officers, hey, there is a camera right there. Maybe you can look and see who did this, you know, who robbed my brother and get um, some footage from there. Um, and basically they ignore it or whatever. So what ends up happening is like a week late later, the brother is out. <clears throat> and by this point, he is paranoid. He is very afraid. And basically, I'm, I'm assuming everybody to him looks like a uh, somebody who stole his book bag. So he's out. He sees two guys um, walking and he assumes that these two guys are the guys that robbed him. So he calls his brother again. His brother meets him and they're walking. And so basically they call the cops. Now, this is the same night Khalif Broder is at a party three blocks from his house, and it's about one o'clock in the morning, and they are on their way back home. Um, and basically, uh, they call the cops, the cops come, and um, the victim says that it they fit the description. Um, basically, um, they're walking in like a dark alley, a dark part. Khalif Browder even says this is, um, is not very lighted at all. So basically the brother says, are you sure about this? Are you sure it's the two guys? And his brother is like, yeah, I'm pretty sure it's him. Um, pretty much, you know, just like everybody, you know, all black people kind of look alike. That's what they think. Um, and so he fits the description of what um, of what the guys that robbed him looked like. Now, he was robbed at night. And once again, when he was walking, he sees two young men at night. So, you know, I'm not going to say, hey, he doesn't know what he's talking about, but I'm going to say this, like, for some odd reason, all Black people seem to look like, especially Black men. So the cops basically just bring uh, Khalif in based on this knowledge. The um, So they don't do this the way that you would see like uh, on a TV series or what we like watching NYPD Blue, uh, Law and Order, all of these shows. Usually if there is a suspect, um, they actually bring them to the precinct, um, Khalif Rodgers precinct where he was at was 48th precinct precinct in New York, usually bring them in, line them up, able to see in clear daylight. And he's able to make, the victim is able to make a clear uh, distinction on who the person is that robbed them. That's not really how that worked. So um, this was like a week later. So the actual accident happened about a week and a half prior to Khalif Browder, um, going to this party and walking home and the victim actually walking back to where he was going and assuming that these the two young men were the same young men that robbed him. What I find really strange is that the other guy, if it was two men, why Khalif's who, friend or whoever was walking with him was never charged as well. That hasn't been talked about at all, but I am curious about that. Um, so... They talk about um, also uh, Detective Carabello, hopefully I'm saying her name right, is the one who reopened the case after they pretty much closed it uh, because they didn't find any victims the, the night that 
the uh, Hispanic guy accused someone of stealing his uh, bag. So uh, after t book bag. So after talking to Carabella, um, the case is reopened, and this is also after Khalif has given his testimony. So basically, uh, she put two and two together and uh, decided to charge Khalif Ryder uh, and reopen the case. And that is how he went to uh, Rikers Island so quickly. Uh, the victim pointed him out. Uh, Carabella opened the case. Now, they were saying that, you know, they, they made claims over and over again that the actual robbery took place where there was a camera. Now, Apparently, you don't have to actually go and get footage from that if the victim has already, like, picked out a person or, you know, made, during a lineup has said these are the people that robbed them. So, um, the only thing that um, I heard during the uh, documentary was that they can basically, like, make a claim against Carabella on past mistakes that she had made in other cases. So there was a case that she made in 2012 that ended up being totally wrong. Um, it was an older guy that was accused of stealing the nine-year-old's bicycle. And this guy was once again taken to Rikers Island and um, not accused as well. And there was footage. And even he says, like, I knew that there was footage. I think that Carabella knew that there was footage all along that she refused to look at. And what you find out on the on the footage is it is an older guy that takes the bicycle, but it is not the man that they accuse of doing it. And it really basically hurts his relationship with his family, with his friends, because they believe that he stole the bicycle as well. So we already know what this does. This does so much damage to you, uh, fa being falsely accused, going to Rikers Island, dealing with Rikers Island is just a mess. And having to deal with this false accusement hurts your reputation, period. Um, so uh, they talk about that. Uh, basically, um, the brother is the, uh, the person that they ended up talking to for this documentary, um, of the victim. The victim, uh, was so paranoid and basically was in so much fear after the robbery that, uh, he could not stay in the United States any longer and move back to Mexico. And when he moved back to Mexico, he did not have any type of communication excuse me, communication with um, the police officers. And so uh, basically this whole victim story is being told by the brother. The brother states that he ne they never ever received any type of phone call or anything in regards to the case. Um, and they had actually been waiting um, to hear from um, the police officers, but they never really did. So there was no report made. There was no follow up. Um, and basically, Khalif Ryder, uh, during this whole thing, is at Rikers Island and um, going to court every other month or every two months or every three months. <clears throat> and basically, there's a continuance. And I told you guys about that um, in the last episode, that a lot of times my inmates in particular, I would ask them about how their cases went because I'm not familiar with it. Um, I'll ask them how their cases went and they'd be like, it's a continuance or, you know, we're waiting on this or we're waiting on that. So basically there's a stall, especially from the DA, the district attorney, there's a stall. They're always waiting for something or waiting for evidence to come back or waiting for this or waiting for that. And basically that's what was going on in Khalif's, um, <clears throat> in, in, uh, Khalif's issue. You know, they kept coming back with nothing, like they had nothing in the first place. And um, that's what was happening the whole time. You know, they already knew that this witness was gone to Mexico. They already knew that they were not going to make contact with this uh, man. And basically, everybody's pushing the blame off on somebody else, which is what we find, you know, people in the judicial system and people do in general. You know, when they're in hot water, they blame it on somebody else. So the assistant district, district attorney is like, oh, I don't remember, you know, I don't recall, you know, I don't know what type of decision that we made. And then you have, um, I forgot the the sister's name that was on there that was like, well, there's many people to blame. Um, she even said that, well, do you blame um, 
the district attorney or the uh, person in charge of um, police officers, do you blame him? No, I don't blame him because everybody voted for him and they liked him. And, you know, uh, you know, I, I, it was all of our faults collectively. You know, it just seemed like a push off on everybody type of deal. Like, I don't really have anything to do with it. She don't have anything to do with it. We don't have anything to do with it. It was just like all over the place. And basically, uh, they pretty much just stalled this whole thing out. Um, <clears throat> briefly, they talk about Khalif um, in uh, um, in Rikers Island for a little bit and what he dealt with with Officer Greenwich, um, which I, I know is going to be strange for some people to hear that a lot of times uh, the officer that will bother you the most is the officer of your same race and color. And Officer Greenwich is a black officer. Um, um, pretty much with a chip on his shoulder. You know, when, like I told you guys before, anytime somebody has power and um, they feel big and they feel, you know, uh, some type of way about their position, uh, they abuse it. And Greenwich was another one who abused his position. And basically, um, Khalif was supposed to be taking out the second shower. And Khalif said that Greenwich was like, I'm going to whoop your ass. And Khalif didn't think anything about it, like it was true. And then next thing you know, once he takes him out of his cell to go take his shower, he basically hits him and abuses him and things like that. And it's so funny, like he slammed him to the floor and you saw like, you saw basically, um, it's not a 10, 10, all available. Okay. What? I'm, I'm using some terms that they use in jail. So a 10, 10 is, a, is if there is a, like a fight and you need assistance. Um, all available is all police, off, all officers that are available to come and assist. There's something going on. There's something big going on. So an all available was called, you saw all the officers rush to basically hold Khalif, restrain Khalif. And then you also see, even, you know, the big rigs, uh, officers, um, and black come to assist as well. Like Khalif did something, even though basically he was pushed. Um, and what, uh, during his deposition, he said that he was hit. Um, he was hit in the face. He had bruises and everything all on his face. And basically on the report, it says that, uh, he hit his face in the shower. Like he kept, banging his head in the shower, which is just ridiculous. Um, and <laughs> I'm sorry, that still just cracks me up. Like the, basically what they said is that he did that. And this is the part that I know a little bit about, like <clears throat> officers do have a, a camaraderie with each other. It's just like going to school with somebody, you know, when you're, um, becoming an officer and you're um, in a, a class of 15, 20 people, like there's this camaraderie, there's this trust, um, you get to know each other. So there is this bond that you have with other officers and it's thick, like it's really thick. You know, um, that's why you see so much backlash now with, you know, every time that um, a black kid or somebody gets shot, the police officers automatically are like this with each other. And, you know, they're backing them up to the point where they're lie. They lie. Like even with the Laquan McDonald situation, all of the guys lie because there's like this bond. There's like this sacred bond that they have, like this fraternal fraternity type bond that they have. And no matter what, they are basically going to stick together. And that's how it is as officers all of them stick together. And um, sometimes that comes across also um, with other people that work in the jail as well, like social workers, psychiatrists, and things of that nature. You have you become linked with that person because you guys work together. You know the inmates. You know the ones that get on your nerves. You know that sometimes they lie. And so basically the psychiatrist puts down that he basically hit himself on the head and he basically did that in order to get out of solitary confinement which in some cases that does happen where they'll do something in order to have um, a lesser sentence in segregation instead like I call it time um, but in this case instead of checking 
to make sure that actually happened. They just went with the story of the officer. The officer said that he wasn't secure. He was resisting, you know, and so basically he had to slam him down. Um, and like I said, that does happen. There's like this bond with each other. Like even I experienced it. And there's a, there's a, a point in that where you have to like kind of draw the line between the two, between, man, I know this officer. We have lunch together. I talk to them. I know this inmate as well. You know, they send me stuff. They let me know different things. I've talked to their parents, blah, blah, blah. And you kind of are stuck in the middle, you know, and trying to find out the truth, you know, and sometimes that's hard to do. Like, you know, being a social worker in this field, I can attest to that. But whatever the truth is, the truth is, you know, yes, you don't want the officer to lose their job and their livelihood and they have families and things like that. But also, if a person is not being treated correctly and you really don't know what they're here for, you got to kind of aim in the middle for the right and the truth. And unfortunately, we see with Khalid Broder, Broder that that really did not happen. So um, basically, uh, that is what's happening um, in this one. I am so sorry. I really am all over the place on here because it was so much um, that happened in this one and it was so good. Um, you just really do have to watch this. Um, so, uh, then they talk about the plea deals. Um, Khalif, uh, rejected 13 plea deals. Can I just say that just fascinated the mess out of me. Khalif rejected 13 plea deals. Um, they even came to him, um, near the end, uh, before they let him out and they offered him a plea deal of two misdemeanors that would only give him four more months to serve and then he'd be done. And he refused that as well. And his mom and his friend was like, man, like, I don't know how he did it because at some point I'll just be like, fine, I'll take the plea deal. Like, forget it. And they talk about this lady, um, this judge that they uh, New York brought in because there were so many cases that were backlogged and hadn't been dealt with and they needed to be closed and they needed to be to be dealt with. So they brought in this uh, judge, a uh, female judge by the name of Judge DeMango. De and it's so funny because the guy that was interviewing for this said he is has a bias towards Domingo. He doesn't really like her. So <laughs> he had nothing nice to say about her or whatever. But basically she was brought in as this no-nonsense judge that could close these cases very quickly, uh, felony cases very quickly. Um, and I believe she has a reality show. I'm pretty sure of it. I have to check. But I believe she has a reality show now or was on one or something. Uh, but anyway, she is uh, known as the plea deal judge. She can get uh, guys to plea deal very quickly. She's sassy. Uh, she's to the point. And so basically, like Khalid Browder's mom said, that was her job. That was what her job was, is to make a plea deal. So um, she had uh, Khalid Browder's um, case as well. And she even tried to punk him into taking a plea deal. But she told him, like, if he didn't take one, that he'd be serving 15 years. Which I'm trying to understand. If a backpack doesn't have that much in there, robbery of less than like $300, why would I be serving 15 years for that? I know that he had a case prior to that, but why would he still, at the age of 16, 17, still serve 15 years for that? I'm really confused on So if you know, please let me know why he would do that if you're a lawyer or whatever, work in the court system, why he would have to serve 15 years. I'm in Chicago. I don't know how it works in New York, but I'm still trying to figure that out. So um, <clears throat> she even tells him like, if you don't take this plea deal, you're going to get 15 years. That's where I have the problem. This is where I'm like, this is the half of the problem here. They stall stuff out so long that most black men end up just taking a plea deal so they can go home and they can get it over with instead of fighting for their case. And what do judges do? Instead of making sure that we have correct information, that all I's are dotted and T's are crossed as far as con uh, cases are concerned, um, instead of making sure victims are actually present in the United States, they say, take the plea deal. You did it. It's almost like 
How is it innocent until proven guilty if you're already telling them to take the plea deal? And I have a problem with her and her little sassiness. She annoyed the shit out of me. She really did. And so um, I was really annoyed by her. But um, basically, uh, at the last, the last time they basically met, she said, look, if you don't have the victim here, I cannot keep holding him. Do you have a victim or not? And of course they did. And so uh, Khalif Browder ends up getting out May 29, 2013. Um, and man, you know, it's so crazy. That boy will not relent. He was like, I'm not about to plead to nothing. Like, I don't care what anybody says. And he even said, he was like, people were saying that I'm stupid. People were saying that I haven't made the right decision, but I cannot in good faith take this court case. Like I can't do it. I mean, I can't take the plea deal. You know, I have to stick to my guns. And I know that makes me seem crazy, but if I didn't do it, I didn't do it. And I, I just admire him for that. I just think his, he's just so courageous and just amazing. I just, oh my God, that boy is just a light. I, I just, ugh, ugh, I just wish he was here so that he would know, oh my God, like, at 16, 17, like I would have took the plea deal. I'm not going, I want to go home. I know what jail is like. Like I know what it looks like in there. I know, especially with the women, you have to ask for pads. <laughs> like I know what it's like, you know, I can't, I, I wouldn't have been able to do it, but he did it. He stayed there for three years, 13 plea deals. And it's like, a of I admire you, Khalif. I love you. And I hope that you know that we think about you quite a bit. So basically that was episode four of the Khalif Browder documentary. Um, if you have not gotten a chance to watch any of the other reviews that I have done, please do so. Please like this video, subscribe to this video. Uh, please look out for other videos that I will be doing. I'll be back most definitely next week for uh, episode five of Khalif Browder. That one is going to be tough to watch. I can already tell. Hopefully you will tune in with me. That's going to be on Spike TV from 9 to 10. And then on BET from 10 to 11. Check your local listings. This is Old School Heart. I hope you've enjoyed this documentary and my review of it. Have a good night.